Welcome to the Female BC Lab Podcast. I have Katie here. Katie, in one line, give me your name, your title, and the name of your fund. Hi, I'm Katie Quilligan. I am an investor at Bank Tech Ventures. Wonderful. What inspired you to become a venture capitalist or an investor? I started my career on the operator side, helping to launch brands, grow audiences, and drive innovation and revenue at startups and larger companies like American Express. And really along the way in both my personal and professional life, I kept finding myself pulled to work with these amazing women who had aspirations of starting their own businesses. And during these journeys and working with them and supporting them, I realized that women are just not getting the same funding. And even now we know that- Still true. Still true. Yeah. What is it? <laughs> 28% of VC funding went to female founded startups and that decreased to just 2% for female only founded startups. And so looking at those numbers, I really thought about what could I do to make a difference? And thinking about that was we really need more diversity on our cap tables who can then go out and hopefully put more diversity into the founders that are being funded. So I went back and I got my MBA and really got my financial skills up and started doing internships and had my first opportunity to work in venture actually with someone local in LA, Petra Griffith, who's the managing director and founder of Webbush Ventures. Oh, and, oh yes. Yeah. Webbush, and then, yes. Uh, yeah, she's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I had the opportunity to work at Bank Tech Ventures. And I was really excited for this opportunity because it was the first time I was able to do investing and also use that innovation side because I get to work with the startups that we invest in, as well as our community banks, limited partners. That's wonderful. What is your thesis? You touched on a little bit yeah. about it and the motivation behind the thesis. Yeah. So Bank Tech Ventures is really, we call ourselves a strategic fund. We're backed okay. by over a hundred community banks created to help them with their innovation and their growth. So it was started in November, 2021, and really by the key leaders in community banking and in the fintech space who saw this need. And so we really look at ourselves as having the opportunity to bridge the gap between traditional community banking and that more modern technology solutions. Mm -hmm. And so we say like what that means simply is we act as the R&D arm of the bank. And so we provide our limited partner banks with market intelligence and also introduce them to like those best in class solutions that will help them with their efficiency, their service offerings, and really help them be more competitive against neo banks and larger banks. And so from like a company standpoint, what that actually looks like is anything that runs a gamut from front office revenue driving solutions, like mm -hmm. a loan origination software to back office cost saving solutions, like a compliance tool. And typically we want a company that has some big traction so we can really just add that fuel to the fire, open up the door, introduce them to our over a hundred LPs and help them get to the next level. And mm -hmm. I think that's also like what motivates us, why we're excited about that is that yeah. we get to for community banks. And I think they are just such the backbone of helping our society continue to grow. They help with creating new jobs. They're responsible yes. for over 60% of our small business loans and over 80% of our agricultural loans. Like that is a huge oh, wow. to help them continue to grow. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. So what are you currently reading or learning or listening to these days? Yeah. So with our investment folks, I'm sure you can imagine, I listen to anything I can, podcasts, webinars, newsletters to just help me stay up to date on the banking and fintech industry uh -huh. and really think about what are the customers that they're serving so that we can be smarter about helping our banks stay ahead of the curve. Uh -huh. And um, actually over the past year, I've been spending a lot of time with how our banks can think about approaching AI. I've been going to different bank conferences. And yeah, banks have yeah. a lot of data sitting there. It could be used in multiple ways, like what products are being, what products are useful, what products are not useful, how do you retire a product, because you're also doing front office and not only back office. Clearly, AI can be used for efficiencies in back office, right? Like you said, loan origination, or if you're a small business, right, the application processes and things of that nature. But that front office of we're offering this product and it's not really successful. So let's see like how we can replace it or how we can efficient, make an efficiency on that side. Because I'm yeah. assuming like a bank has a hard time retiring a product, right? <laughs> we have a hard time retiring our 
products, I would say. Is like a bank specifically, though, right? When the, Like Microsoft can just say, we're not going to support this anymore. Sorry. Like yeah. Google, they, they got rid of their podcast. They said, we're not going to support this more. Sorry, right? You migrate all your stuff. If you have a bank product and you've been using the bank product and you're one of the people and they feel like it's not that successful, I still feel like it's harder for them to say, sorry, we're not going to do this anymore. <laughs> No, definitely. And I think particularly for our community banks who are so focused on that relationship driven part Mm -hmm. and that they want to make sure they're delivering on that. And so if they have a customer who wants to do it, they want to fulfill on that. I think some of our job then is to help them. Okay, you have this product and maybe it's not as good or it's not getting as much traction. What can we give you? That's a better solution that can even take that to the next level. So maybe it's not a, do we have to stick with something bad, but finding even something better that will answer more problems. Yes. And AI, AI can help with that as well. Yeah. And so I think like a lot of what we actually spend time on when I talk to these things is like real use cases. But I think there's so many yes. objects that are like, oh, <laughs> so cool. We could do that. We could do that. And instead of what can you do? And also the banks are in such a tough regulatory environment. Yes. And it's really not clear what they are and are not allowed to do at this time. Like it's just, it's evolving and we're keeping an eye on the space. And so thinking about, we really tell them about, let's think about using AI solutions that is almost like an intern to you, where it yes. expands your ability to do things just like an intern would, but also at the end of the day, you're still ultimately resp- responsible for anything that comes out of that product Correct. and anything that you're doing. If you know that it might not do something that it's supposed to, you're going to stop it and have that human in the loop. Thing. So that's a lot of what, just like real world use cases, things like creating marketing copy and, and other yeah. things you can like create some easy efficiency wins and get those small wins, get everyone excited about it. And then you can test it in small environments and then move it out to the larger bank and then think about taking on bigger projects that might be a little bit more of a stretch. You know what? The compliance issue is a good point, right? Because if there was marketing copy can easily be fixed, corrected, right? Readjusted <laughs> by human, right? And some of it is how you ask AI, just like how you ask Google, right? How do you search? It's similar. How do you ask the AI to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C? And you still need a human to intervene now because it's semi-smart. I'll call it semi-smart. It's not super smart, but the reality is you still need a person to review things. Even, I guess, copy because at the bank, if somebody read it and then like it it went out, Mm-hmm. I guess it could, the bank could be held responsible for mm-hmm. that at some levels. And therefore, you need to be careful with kind of all the, everything you're doing in an AI. And even though it's an efficiency, mm-hmm. right? So maybe instead of you taking eight hours, it takes 20 minutes, mm-hmm. but you still need to have the review of the compliance. Yeah. So that's interesting that the banking is going through the same thing like for the blockchain space. So I'm in the blockchain space and we've been going up to Congress many years in a row, many years in a row, trying to get the regulatory clear around what is a blockchain, what is a digital currency, what is a digital asset. And the banks were having the same issues with that as well, right? Yeah. What is the real world use cases of these things? And, yeah. and how does it fit into the heavy compliance areas? Same thing in healthcare, right? As well, right? If you're, these are all heavily compliance areas. So how do you really utilize these technologies Mm-hmm. where if if a mistake happens, it could be catastrophic. I'll put it that way. Yes, I agree. And, then, but, and there's also the other hand of if you stymie innovation too much and you don't allow them to try some of these technologies, then you're really hurting them from doing things. And particularly Absolutely. with community banks, where we know that we have a large generation of people retiring, they mm-hmm. need this technology to help them to overcome that hurdle and to even one of the solutions we were looking at is documenting someone's processes and making sure yes. that you know exactly what they were doing in their role before mm-hmm. they, leave. and typically you're doing that by hand, that's multi days or hours or you hire very expensive consulting companies. Mm-hmm. This one is utilizing AI to actually do that faster. And that's mm-hmm. really not like having any customer facing issues, but that's yeah. just going to help the bank with those efficiencies. And so if you can yes. write who comes in and just sees AI in the name and then starts pushing on something as simple as that, you're holding them back from actually being able to innovate and spend time on what really matters for pushing the bank forward. No, oh, and like you said, I like how you said it's more like an intern. Yeah. Right? You would use it like an intern. Yeah. 
how would you use an intern? So that's a perfect example, right? An intern would probably map, right? That's how I would use an intern. Okay, I need for you to map these processes. And so replacing that with the AI makes sense. And so I, I think it, it's similar to to some of these other areas that AI's, all these questions are happening in all these areas where it's heavily compliance or even just not heavily compliance. And it's okay, AI is great. How do we balance innovation mm -hmm. with human intervention, mm -hmm. with benevolence or friendliness or, or how it should work in a positive way? <laughs> it's all three balances, right? Yeah. Because it could be a catastrophic, and I'll just say a catastrophic event because you used AI and it didn't, and you depended on it. Yes. And, and this is the other thing from the human intervention side is it's not, early, it's still early in the game of AI. And so it still doesn't understand like human intervention still has to happen so that the innovation does occur because the thing that AI also helps you do. And I do some work with some high net worth people around this is it does help with the, it does move the innovation forward, but it, it's always constant because pe the people, because people are the ones that kind of are resistant to it really. Yes. I think that's also a multiple shift and that's a little yes. bit weak about too. And when I do these presentations of how do we help teams be open or see where it is and particularly where you might feel like it could take your job. And a lot of what we talk about is let's have this shift of it's not going to take your job. It's going to take away the tasks you don't want to do. Right. Let's think about it from that mindset and that these are tasks too, that maybe no one's going to want to do in the future. So it'll be hard for you to hire these positions. So let's help you with those. And it's not, it doesn't have to be scary. It can be mm -hmm an exciting piece. And as long as you're thinking about it smart and you're pulling in data that is relevant to it, then you can have positive outcomes. And it, it can make you more strategic as a, like more strategic in a company in general, even in the bank. Right. So that, that actually ends up becoming a powerful piece of it. Yes. Okay. Bonus question. Okay. Everyone gets it. In two that. years, how do you see venture capital or investing having changed or evolved? Great question. I think that it's continued. Obviously, we've seen such a shift of incredibly high blown out valuations and then swinging the other way. And I think it will continue to come more in the middle. And mm -hmm. I continue to be excited for companies that are both pushing forward and taking swings on innovation and doing those, but also are more balanced with their approach of let's look at the fundamentals. Let's look at the margins. Does this business actually scale? We right. can't just throw money at this to continue this issue. It needs to be more. And so I, I think that balance is what I'm excited about as we think about these new companies and what that can mean. And that I really see like right now, it seems like solutions are going out as an AI solution. Mm -hmm. In the future, everything is just going to have AI in it. Yeah, it's a complete digitized infrastructure. That's how I look at AI or blockchain or any of these kind of advanced technologies. They're going to be all digital. They're all infrastructure, really. Exactly. Digital and infrastructure. So I think about that, like, how are these companies, I'm excited for what the efficiencies they're going to be able to do with mm -hmm. this technology and how they're going to be able to scale faster and smarter utilizing what's coming out now. I like your point about the revenue the business fundamentals, I'll call them business 101, right? The basic blocking tackling. What are mm -hmm. your margins? What are your revenues? How are you scaling the revenues? Mm -hmm. How are you looking at scaling revenues? How are you looking at customer acquisition? How are you looking? Like, that's critical. And I think, too, there had, like, there's been a shift on the money side. I think there also has to be a slight shift on the startup side. Because I'm sure, as I see, companies that still say, I have no revenues. Okay, so what do you build some? That's great. Yeah. So then how do you really prove that somebody wants what you have? Yes. Right? You got to get the external revenue. You have to, that's the validation. Yeah. Like if you have a software, that's the validation. Hardware yeah. is a little bit different. But <laughs> and, and even more of that focus on, do you just have a nice solution with no problem that someone's willing to pay for? Correct. I think is Correct. exactly what it is. Just like really getting back to that fundamental of the research ahead of time. And that's particular where we spend so much time with our banks and validating something before we do it of, is this actually something that's going to solve our bank's problem? Or do you just think it's going to solve a bank's problem? And you know what? That's a good point. Since you have so many banks, right? If it, if you're guessing, and I'll just say guessing, sure. then what homework did you really do? 
how did you really evaluate that this is a problem with a bank at all? Yeah. Is it your personal problem? Damn, if, every time I go to the bank, X happens, right? Did yeah. you, is it your personal? Well, because yeah. theoretically, that could be across multiple people and across multiple banks. Or are you just saying, I built this thing for banks and therefore I think it'll work? It's like, where, how did you come about creating, imagining what that problem was and what's the real problem you're solving? Yes. And I think that's particularly where I find our job so exciting because we get to sit in between these entrepreneurs mm-hmm. who have amazing ideas and are pushing the envelopes and banks who do have the regulatory pressures. And so I yes. have to be a little bit slower to innovate and helping mm-hmm. find that middle ground of what is the good piece of innovation? Where can we push this forward? And where can we help our entrepreneurs realize maybe you need to put this in chunks, like perhaps stage one of this, the bank can accept this now. And in the future, you can help grow to this bigger vision is a big part of that as well. Yeah, that's super important. All right. So how do people contact you? Yeah. LinkedIn is always great. Or at my email address at katie at banktechventures.com. All right. So thank you so much, Katie.